thank you for asking me to speak about the impacts of climate change on women and girls. And discuss this, we really have to, because in an already unequal world, the triple planetary crisis, the crisis of climate change, of biodiversity loss, and of pollution and waste, is only making our world more unequal and more divided. Because every crisis we face, from COVID-19 to poverty to hunger, to the climate crisis, has a female face. 70% of women live in poverty. And as we chip away at the natural world, daily tasks like securing water, food and fuel, which are often done by women and girls, take longer and are harder. And this forces many girls to drop out of school, to have the time to support their homes with those tasks. As the poorest households continue to shoulder the burden of climate change and extreme weather events, young girls, often with little education or financial independence, are often forced into early marriage. In fact, 12 million girls are married every year before they reach the age of 18. And we all know that women are the farmers for the world, but we also know that they often don't have rights to land or the land titles. In fact, women own less than 10% of land in the world. And here in Africa, from where I speak, four in five women lack access to a bank account or a financial institution. Without land tenure and without access to credit, women will be unable to adapt to climate change and the trends, and women will be unable to withstand the climate shocks. And as we pollute our planet, women are at a higher risk. Let's talk, for example, about indoor pollution. Many women have to cook over charcoal stoves indoors and breathe in that smoke. Or we have toxic chemicals in the workforce or in the agricultural field. Or indeed, we have poor sanitation that impacts our health. So I paint this somewhat pessimistic picture, not to discourage you, far from it, but because in every generation, it is the young people who challenge the status quo and force change. And gender equality in a climate changing world can and must be how we define our future. Many of you will have heard the amazing Amanda Gorman speak at the US inauguration a year ago. And in another poem, she speaks to, and she says, quote, the way forward isn't the road we take. The way forward is a road women make. So allow me to share a few ideas on the road women can make. First, we all have to take charge and lead where we work, where we are placed in our own organizations or places of work or study. My own boss, Secretary General Antonio Guterres, has made gender parity a key United Nations priority, especially in the senior leadership. And I'm pleased that we've made some progress. But there's lots more work to be done, which is why all of the United Nations agencies, programs, etc., really push and articulate an em emphasis on women's economic inclusion, on investment in the care economy, and on green jobs. So my first point really is, be the change inside where you are, your organizations or your jobs, to make gender equality a key issue. And secondly, I encourage everyone, male, female, boy, girl, to embrace feminist leadership, true feminist leadership that embodies compassion, strength and direction. We know that women are stewards of our planet, whether it's on the peace agenda or the climate agenda. But the truth is also that we have too few women in top jobs who can bring some of those values to the table. In fact, in 2020, uh, we had only 15% of the top jobs were women ministers of the environment sectors. And I believe that that's an unacceptable number. Not that every woman environment minister will be a feminist leader necessarily, but there is an opportunity here to bring more female voices to the table. And it's time to open the doors to more women leaders, because as the UN Secretary General has pointed out, male-dominated team will come up with male-dominated solutions. So I say to you, we've had enough of male-dominated solutions, and we need to reinvigorate environmental multilateralism. Putting women at the heart of environmental decision-making is therefore critical. So that's my second point, feminist leadership, embraced by all. My third point is that we have to embrace science. But science has to be delivered and speak with much greater diversity at its core. 
It's about 30% of the world's researchers that are women, and many fewer hold top senior positions in research institutions. Amongst the top 100 scientific papers published on climate in the last five years, less than half were authored by women, and only 12 papers, 12, had female lead authors. Climate change is complex. It's a discipline that is not easy to decipher. But to be successful, and by this I mean science that moves into policy, it's critical that science is informed by diverse perspectives and diverse solutions. So that's my third point. Engage in science and make the science come alive with female solutions. And my fourth point is that women's freedom to choose and to act on our full range of human rights, from health and to all other points in our lives, is a critical foundation for a more just and a more sustainable world. But unfortunately, women's choices and freedoms are under attack in many places. So I ask you to raise your voices loud and clear because decisions reversing progress on women's reproductive rights will have a wider impact on the rights and choices of women and adolescents everywhere. So that is my fourth point. And finally, as we seek to ensure a just transition to a green and sustainable future, we have to reorient financial flows, economic models, and we need to invest in resilience and capacity building. And all of these tracks have to be gender responsive. Because sure, on paper, women can benefit from green jobs. But let's face it, it's only if those investments are backed by real policies and real programs that we can see that women can actually gain access. And that means we have to take into account women's uh, reduced access to uh, formal sector employment and women's reduced access to education so that we can begin to level that playing field much better in the new green jobs world. So with these words, I ask you to raise your voice. Because when women lack resources, when women lack rights, when women lack voice, when women lack freedom to move and agency over our bodies, we become trapped in a high climate risk environment. And that simply won't work. So let me quote from the Nobel laureate Malala Yousafzai. She said, I raise up my voice, not so that I can shout, but so that those without a voice can be heard. We cannot all succeed when half of us are held back. Thank you.